everyone, we're going to get started. Um, and just wanted to welcome everyone to, for taking out your time to join us today. Um, we know that there's a lot you could be doing, but you chose to be with us today. And so we're very grateful for you all joining us for what we know is a very important session that I think will be beneficial for everyone today. So welcome. Uh, this is our session uh, amongst our educator track titled Anti-Racism in the Classroom and Wellness 101 with our guest facilitator, Tara Lynn Little, who is the program director for early literacy at Expanded Schools. And um, I'll do a little bit more of an intro for Tara Lynn in, in a moment, uh, but just wanted to welcome you all. Um, so my name is Adnan Karim. Uh, I get the privilege of serving as the Managing Director of Human Rights Education here at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, working closely with our Speak to the Power team, Laura, Jenny, Karen, and our intern, Jessica. So very glad to have all of you with us today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to explain a little bit more about Speak Truth to Power. So Speak Truth to Power is a multifaceted human rights education program here at Robert F. Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. And it's really grounded in powerful storytelling, standards aligned curriculum and resources, and a spectrum of assets that any educator can use that's simply passionate about building an environment that protects and advances human rights, uh, both in and out of the classroom. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways, but our multiple, our, our ultimate goal through Speak Truth to Power is threefold. So the first goal within Speak Truth to Power is really around building educator capacity so that you can ingrain human rights into the fabric of your pedagogy. And we do that primarily through educator trainings, much like we're doing today with our guest facilitator. And we do that through the development of resources, lesson plans, and other educational assets that are tailored and flexible to use across a variety of, of classroom uh, expertise, whether you teach theater, visual arts, you teach math, you teach science, social studies, there's something there for you within our, our resources. The second thing that we're really focusing on is the integration of social and emotional learning into human rights education with the third goal of what we call is becoming a defender where every youth is engaged in meaningful and mindful action through community and uh, organizing and advocacy. So the integration of social emotional learning so that you can be effective and ethical and, and really mindful in your approaches to taking action, both locally and globally. Um, so what I wanna do now is pass it over to our training manager, Laura Ostendorf, who will explain a little bit more about the, 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 the focus of human rights education as it relates to anti-racist education as well. Thank you, Adnan. As he mentioned, I'm the training manager at RFK Human Rights. And as the Speak Truth to Power team, we felt really compelled to have this workshop on anti-racist classrooms and wellness, recognizing not only the relation of anti-racist education as a related and interconnected field of human rights education, but also the important principle of non-discrimination that is crucial to the human rights framework. Our Speak Truth to Power program is rooted in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which directly states in Article 2 that there should be no discrimination on basis of race, religion, national, or social origin. And frankly, it's an issue that we cannot ignore when the United Nations Human Rights Council holds meetings in which the current racially inspired human rights violations, systemic racism, police brutality, and violence against peaceful, peaceful protests in the U.S. are discussed. Moreover, we recognize that human rights education is a means to promote understanding, tolerance, equality, and respect for all people and groups. Human rights education encompasses education about, through, and for human rights. In providing education about human rights, we seek to provide information about human rights principles of human dignity throughout history, as well as human rights abuses, including systemic racism and its roots. Education through human rights should foster inclusivity, understanding, and an appreciation of diversity that will make the classroom a safe space that enhances personal well-being. And finally, education for human rights should empower students in their pursuit of social justice, including their role as an ally in advocating for Black lives. 
I think that we can go to the next slide. And this just shows the framework of human rights education. And as you can see, there are many sub-related fields, including multicultural education, development education, and here we have anti-racist education within that framework. And we just truly believe that human rights education should be used as a practice to strengthen human dignities so that we can call out racial injustice in our daily lives. So I will pass it back to Adnan so he can introduce our brilliant facilitator, Tara Lynn. Thank you you. Um, so um, I am so excited to present uh, this session today hosted by us with our guest facilitator Tara Lynn who is a former colleague and friend. I've known her for maybe over 10 years now so thank you so much for being with us. Tara Lynn, uh, Tara Lynn is the program director of early literacy at Expanded Schools which is an intermediary nonprofit that builds capacity in the after school field. And she is the founder of Well Lit, which focuses on story based wellness for children. Um, sorry, my screen. It's a, it's a Well Lit, which focuses on story based wellness for children. She is a devoted and passionate educator slash activist. Uh, Tara Lynn began her career in the youth development sector as a group leader and program coordinator in after school and summer programs in her native Jamaica, Queens. Over the past decade, she has worked with schools, community-based organizations, and youth-focused nonprofits across New York City as an educator, curriculum developer, trainer, and coach. She serves on the local steering committee and national curriculum committee for Black Lives Matter at school, has served on the associate boards for Generation Citizen and Girl Be Heard, and is an active community volunteer. Her current focus is on the intersections between child development, wellness, and literacy. Uh, with that, I'm so happy to introduce Tara Lynn to lead us through the rest of our session. So Tara Lynn, I'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share. Okay. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, wonderful. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you, Anand, um, for that introduction. And thank you um, to Anand and Laura and the team at um, RK Human Rights for inviting me um, to spend this time with you all today. I also want to thank you all for joining. Um, I know we are going through a very trying time. Um, and for those of you and us who are educators, um, really trying to wrap our heads around the start of a school year. And so I know that there's plenty on everyone's plate. And so just wanted to thank and acknowledge you for making space and taking space for this conversation, um, for this conversation today. Um, like Anand said, my name is Tara Lynn. Um, most folks call me T, so feel free to call me T um, throughout the session um, if you have questions or have, um, have comments. Um, so like Anand said, the focus of today's session is really going to be um, having a starter conversation about um, how does racism show up in the classroom space and being able to really identify um, how that manifests, thinking about the connections between how racism plays out and the wellness of the children and young people that we work with, and then starting to think about what are some questions and considerations that we can use as educators to start to reflect um, on our practice as anti-racist and human rights educators. Um, so before we dive into the first part of that conversation, um, we're gonna start with some community building. Um, for me, anti-racist work um, is grounded in community and collective action. Um, and a big part of that work is shifting away from this idea of the individual and really orienting ourselves towards collective and community. And so, you know, even though this is hard to do in the digital space, I do wanna spend some time building our community and getting to know who is here with us. Um, so we're gonna start um, just with some introductions and we won't be able to do it um, through verbal introductions because of the size of our group, um, but I am going to ask everyone just to introduce themselves so we can see who's here. So the way that we are going to do that is through I am intros. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is just think of what you like to be called. So that can be your full name, a nickname, a shortened name, and anti-racist work is also about affirmation, right? And so I want you to think about three things that you really love and value about yourself. Okay, so three things you really love and value about yourself. And I want you to craft that into an intro statement. So for example, my intro statement is my name is T. 
and I am a kind, determined, and curious human. Okay? So for our introductions, I want you to take a moment just to think on your own and craft your I am statement. So who are you? And three ways that you would describe yourself, three things you love about yourself. So just take a moment to think on your own and then I'll let you know how we're gonna share. So as you are ready, I want to invite you to go ahead and start dropping your I am intros in the chat, okay? And as other folks are here, I invite you to, I know sometimes we get a influx of things in the chat and it's hard to read, but I invite you to scroll up and down and just take a look at who's here today. Let's take a look at who's here today. So go ahead and start dropping your intros in the chat. So we've got some compassionate humans, we've got some lifelong learners, we've got some loyal humans in the building today, we've got some folks that are empathetic and curious, folks that are spiritual, celestial, I love that. Hi Benji. Folks that are visionary, servant leaders, loud, yes, loud, learning. So I'm seeing a lot about learning and empathy and compassion. Works in progress. Oh, no. oh, I forgot it in the call. Oh, thanks. I forgot it in the So definitely continue to add your intro to the chat and definitely take a look at who else is joining us today. Um, but thank you all just for doing that quick introduction just so we can see who's here, here, see your names, um, see what kind of people are joining us today. And so thank you. Um, so now that we've gotten to know who's here a little bit, um, I just wanna check in on how everybody's doing, right? So another part of this work um, is thinking about the social and emotional um, needs and space of of ourselves and the young people that we that we work with um, and recognizing that our not only are we but also our students are bringing their own lives their own experiences their own things to the table um, and it's important that we recognize that humanity and just check in on how's everybody doing before we get into our tasks or our business or what we have to get done um, and so I am an elementary school teacher at heart um, and so we're going to bring some elementary school spirit into, into the session for this check-in. So I want you to think about on a scale of one, two, three, and I'm going to share just an anchor for you to help on just how you're feeling today. Okay? There's no right or wrong answer. All feelings are valid and everything is welcome. So if you're a one, you're super excited, really happy, having a pretty great day. Things are going really well. Okay. You're at a two, things are okay. It's not the best day, it's not the worst. They're just kind of fine, kind of in the middle, a little bit of a mixed bag. And if you're three, maybe it's not the best day, you know? Maybe it's a little bit of a struggle, maybe a little tired, a little stressed. Um, and so there's two ways that I'm gonna invite you to share, okay? So if your camera is on and you're comfortable engaging in that way, you can engage with your body, okay? So you can show me with your hands and you can give me a one, two, or three finger rating if you would prefer you can also just drop your rating in the chat. So I'm gonna give everybody, just take 10 seconds to yourself, think about where you are. And I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and show me either with your body, using your finger rating or in the chat. <laughs> I'm seeing some folks using their whole bodies to show us how they're doing, which I appreciate. see how we're doing. Okay, so seeing a lot of twos and threes. Okay, so some folks that are kind of in the middle. Not the best, not the worst, but all right, somewhere in the middle. Some folks are having a really wonderful day. 
some folks are in between and it's seeing one or two folks where it's not the best day okay maybe not feeling so great um and so thank you again for sharing who you are sharing a little bit about you and sharing where you're at um so i just want to acknowledge that right there's a full spectrum of how we're showing up today we all have like our students different things going on in our lives, in the world that can impact what we're bringing to spaces and how we're feeling, and that's all valid. Um, and so with that check in mind, I just want to acknowledge you and I want to invite you um, and just let you know that all of that is welcome. How you're feeling today is welcome in our space. Um, I want you to feel free to bring your full authenticity, your ideas, your questions, your vulnerability to this space. Um, all of that is welcome. Um, and I hope that over the course of our session, even if you're not having the best day, um, that you have an opportunity to connect with others in a way that helps you feel inspired moving forward. So the last part of our community building um, is just thinking about community agreements, right? So we've taken a moment to get to know each other. We've taken a moment just to check in and see where we're at with our moods and our feelings today. Um, and to invite all of that and everyone and themselves into the space. Um, and a part of being able to show up fully in a space is feeling as though you are safe and in community with others that are going to keep you safe. Um, and so the goal of our community agreements is really to think about what are we going to commit to one another today as we have this conversation? Okay, what are we gonna to commit to to make sure that everyone can learn and grow and engage and feel safe? while also challenging themselves in this space. So I wanna offer some community agreements that I use often, whether in the classroom, um, in meetings and workshops. And then I'm gonna invite you to also think about what else, what else might you need from this community to engage in this conversation today. Um, so the first community agreement I wanna offer um, is open hearts, open ears, open minds. Sometimes I read them out of order, um, that's okay. Um, and really the heart of that community agreement is just being open, okay? We're here to listen. Um, we're here to be open to new perspectives. We're here to be open to new ways of being, to thinking about things in a way that we haven't before, okay? Our second agreement is just to take space and make space, right? We're gonna get the most out of this conversation by inviting everyone to share. Um, there's a saying that I actually learned in another workshop with Aorta, um, which is an organization that focuses on kind of anti-oppressive facilitation um, and one of the statements that they always share is um, that um, all of us know something, none of us know everything, together we know a lot. And so everyone in this group today has something to bring from lived experience, from study, from expertise, and something to learn myself as a facilitator. So I'm going to be listening and learning and taking um, from your expertise and your lived experience and your study as well. Um, so take up space, share, ask questions, bring yourself in, and then also notice where we need to make space for other voices as well. Okay. So another community agreement is just owning our impact, right? We all have impact, whether intentional or unintentional. The things we say that we do impact the space and the people around us. And so we're just gonna take responsibility and ownership when we speak, when we engage, when we comment. Um, and if someone is to raise a concern um, or raise a harm in this space, we're going to own and hear that impact, okay? Um, we're also going to lean into giving grace. Okay, I saw a lot in your comments that we have a lot of learners, right? We're all learning, we're all growing, we're all changing, and that also requires giving ourselves and each other some grace. Okay. Um, another one that I want us to think about is checking in instead of checking out. Um, we start to lean into conversations that can be uncomfortable um, or conversations that challenge us. It's only natural as a human um, for emotions to rise, um, sometimes stress, sometimes anxiety, um, which can lead to us checking out or shutting down to protect ourselves. Um, what I'm gonna ask everyone to do is if you start to feel um, discomfort, if you start to feel any of those things, you start to feel defensiveness, anything that comes up for you, um, if you feel safe to, and if you feel comfortable to, I'm gonna invite you to be curious about that, okay? Why am I feeling that way? Why is this coming up for me? And I'm going to invite you to check in with that. And checking in could be, let me ask myself some questions around what's going on with me right now. That could be checking in with me as a facilitator. So it could be sending me a note. Um, it could be taking some space if you need to, to take a deep breath, think, and then come back to the session. 
whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, I encourage you to do, but think about how you can be curious about any feelings, thoughts, or emotions that come up today. And then ultimately take care of yourself, okay? Please take care of yourself, get water, get snacks, eat your food if you need to, um, do whatever you need to do to take care of your mind and your body. Um, so those are some community agreements that I wanted to offer, but I also wanted to leave open some space for anything else that we feel like we need from the community. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause for a minute. Um, if you have something you wanna share, you can add it in the chat. If you'd like to offer your voice to the space, feel free to um, use the function in the chat just to raise your hand if you'd like to share your thought out loud. We feeling good with these so far? Okay. If over the course of the session, something comes up, feel free to send me a note in the chat and say, hey, I don't think we're adhering to these agreements or hey, I think we actually need something else based on this conversation is going. Um, we can have these be fluid based on how our discussion is going, okay? All right. So for today's focus, um, just to quickly reiterate, even though we've gone through this, um, the three things we're gonna be looking at are how does racism manifest in our classrooms? Um, how can we connect that to wellness and the wellness of the young people that we work with on different dimensions of wellness? And what are some considerations for creating classrooms through a lens of anti-racism and human rights? I want to acknowledge that we have about an hour left for this conversation. Um, and so we are not going to cover um, all of the ways that racism manifests in our schools, all the ways it has impact, or all of the things that we can do um, to address it. But hopefully this will get our minds turning and making some connections that can lead to future conversation and future study. And then just to reiterate, we're gonna be working through two lenses today. The first one is an anti-racist lens. Um, and so I added um, this quote, which says um, that anti-racism is an active and conscious effort to work against the multi-dimensional aspects of racism. And the thing I like about this is the two words, active and conscious, right? So active um, anti-racist work, human rights education is both conscious. So we are leaning in and deliberately building our awareness and building our understanding, and we are using that to be active. It's not one without the other, it's both, okay? And it's not passive, okay? And then thinking about human rights education, um, Adnan and Laura were able to introduce us to that framework earlier, but we're gonna be making some connections between these two concepts. And so thinking about how does anti-racism connect with this approach of human rights education, where we're really centering this idea of learning about for and through human rights as central to, to teaching and to education and to the function of education. So not as an add-on, but central to the function of, of our learning environment and the core purpose of, of education. Mm -hmm. So our opening discussion is really gonna start with this idea of racism in the classroom. And to do that, um, I just wanna give us an opportunity to ground on some common definitions. And so I want you all to take a moment just to think about this question, okay? So what is racism? Okay, in order to be able to address it, we have to understand what it is. And so I just want you to think for a moment to yourself, how would you define racism? If you had to explain this to someone, what would you say it is? Okay. And to respond to this, we're actually gonna do a quick stop and jot, and we're gonna do this in a Jamboard. And so the way it's gonna work is I am going to drop a link in the chat for our Jamboard. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is go ahead and click that link and you're gonna join me over in the Jamboard, okay? So you're gonna join me over in the Jamboard once you click that link, okay? So the way that the Jamboard works, if you haven't used it before, is over here on the side panel, there are some post-its. And so you can click one, you can choose a color and you can add your comment and it's gonna splash up on the board. And so I want us all just to take a moment just to splash up and you can put in most multiple post-its if you like, just to splash up how you would define racism. What is it? So as you're ready, you can go ahead to start to splash some ideas onto the board. If you have trouble engaging with the Jamboard for technical reasons, that's okay. You can also share your ideas in the chat. Both of them are fine, but as you're ready, go ahead and start sharing some ideas.
And as folks are splashing their ideas up on the Jamboard, I just want you to look for trends, okay? So look for things that are common across people's comments. Look for things that stand out to you, things that might be a different or new idea, something you didn't think of before in your definition of racism. Okay, so as folks splash ideas up, look for themes, look for trends, and look for things that might be different or new from the way that you were thinking about it or the way that you previously defined it. Carolyn, there was a question. Was a question. Um, explain again how to use the board uh, with the tools on the... Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Adnan. So right over here in the side panel, right underneath the circle where you see that arrow in the middle, if you go down one, you'll see something that looks like a little post-it. And if you click on that, it'll open up a box for you to type your sticky note, and then you just hit save. And if you found a way to just add it to the Jamboard in another way, that's okay too. Okay, so we're gonna take another couple of seconds just to splash ideas and then take a look. And again, we're looking for trends, looking for anything that's different or new, something that you hadn't thought of before. So let's come back to the main screen. Okay, so before we move on just to grounding in a common definition, I just wanted to open it up for any thoughts or reactions. Um, so first, just wanted to hear any trends that you saw. So what were some things that were a trend or themes across the different definitions that folks splashed on the board? Have one or two people share any themes that they heard. And again, if you want to share out loud, you can unmute yourself and speak, or you can use the function in the chat to raise your hand. So one thing that I'm seeing in the chat is there's a theme of oppression. Okay, this idea of some folks being kept down in some type of way. Okay. Okay, some group being better than another. So someone being upheld. Um, in a way that's over or superior to someone else. Okay. Other trends? Okay, that it also manifests in systems. Sure. Did anyone see or read anything that was new to them? or that was different than their previous definition of racism or understanding of racism? Okay. okay, so Brian highlighted this idea of power struggle involving people who didn't earn that power to begin with. All right, so thank you all for sharing. So just wanna ground ourselves in some common definitions and common types of racism before we move on to how this may manifest in our classrooms. Um, so when we think about race, um, race is a social construction and a social construction based on color of skin um, that has been used to justify um, how people are treated, what opportunities they receive, what opportunities they don't receive, where they live, their education, their healthcare, um, whether their culture is accepted and considered appropriate or proper, um, really every aspect of life that you can think of. Um, and we think about racism, we're thinking about beliefs and actions and systems that reproduce this racial hierarchy, okay? So it's beyond just belief. Belief is a part of it, but it actually manifests as actions and systems and practices and policies that have a real impact on how people live. Um, and I think that's an important thing about race and racism is that while race is a social construction, the impact of that social construction is very real 
and very felt and manifests in very real ways um, that leads to power and privilege for some and oppression and marginalization for others. Um, and so as we think about how this might manifest in the classroom, I wanted to highlight, sorry, my work slack um, has decided to go off at this moment, um, some different common or more specific categorizations of racism that we can use to really think about how this might show up in our classroom. Um, so one that I wanted to highlight um, is ideological racism. So we think about that, we're thinking again about ideology, our thoughts, our ideas, um, our beliefs, our values. Um, so what we think about people, what we believe about people, um, and how that again manifests in our actions. When we think about representational racism, that's really looking at how are people, partic particularly people who are coming from a marginalized identity or people of color, are represented um, in popular culture and in our media. So looking at literature, looking at movies, looking at the news, looking at narratives in popular culture, how are people represented? Okay, what tropes are being used? What stereotypes are being used um, to deliberately um, disenfranchise people? Okay, so thinking about how people are represented. Um, represent, representational racism can be through deliberately using tropes and stereotypes um, or harmful representations. It can also be done through singular representations. Um, and so presenting a certain group or a certain identity or certain race as only one narrative or one way of being and not recognizing the diversity within that group. So focusing on um, single stories or single narratives. Um, representational racism can also be erasure. So total lack of representation. So it really exists across that spectrum of no representation to singular representation to harm, deliberately harmful representation. Okay, we think about everything from mascots um, and how those show up to how um, Black people are criminalized by the media. Um, and so those are all different examples of representational racism. Okay. We think about discursive racism. That's how we talk about people. So our conversation, our discourse, our discussion. Um, and so what is the language that we use when we talk about people, okay? And again, that can be the very co overt type of racism where we're talking about hate speech and racial slurs, things that are very observable. Um, and we're also talking about things like racially coded language. So when we hear terms like ghetto, when we hear terms like disadvantaged, um, coded language that has that subtext, that's not so easily spotted or not so easily called out. And so how we talk about people shapes narratives, it shapes beliefs, it shapes ideas, it also shapes actions. And so the thoughts we have and the words we use when we're talking about people contribute to their lived experiences, um, to policy, to law, to practice. Um, and so the language that we use is very, very important. Um, when we talk about interactional racism, that's our interactions between one another. So how we treat one another, okay? And again, when we think about interactional racism, that can be the very covert, in your face type of racism, sorry, overt, in your face type of racism, where there might be an assault or a hate crime or something of that nature that's very obvious and very visible. Interactional racism can also occur in the form of microaggressions. It can also occur in the form of exclusion um, it can occur in the form of seeing someone of a certain race that you perceive because of bias and because of ideological racism as a threat and crossing to the other side of the street. That is also interactional racism. So even though it's not overt and it's not engaging directly with that person, you have shifted your interaction because of your ideology or belief about that person. And then the last two that I wanted to highlight are institutional, um, sometimes called structural racism. And so this is when racism is embedded and carried out and manifested in our institutions. So through policy, through law. And so when we start to look at education, housing, healthcare, um, community development, environmental justice. Um, so these are things that are embedded in the laws and policies and structures and systems of our society um, that deliberately reinforce, again, this racial hierarchy and this social structure that marginalizes people of color, disenfranchises people of color um, through policy, law, structure, and deliberate action in our societal institutions. 
And we think about racism systematically, that's where we bring it all together. All of these things don't work in isolation or silos. They all work together to maintain a historical and deeply rooted system of oppression in our culture and in our country, okay? So when we think about our thoughts, media, representation, narratives, language, interpersonal interactions, institutions, all of those things work together in a system to maintain the current status quo. And so the last thing that I wanted to call out here, uplift here, um, was that across all of these, we have covert and overt racism. Um, and so we have those things that are very visible, very in your face, um, what we might call egr egregious. Um, and then we have those things that are not so easy to point out or not so easy to see or that are not commonly agreed on as being problematic um, and that are sometimes harder to address. And so I wanted to uplift um, this quote by Sophie Carmichael, which leans a little bit into how these two things play out. Um, can I have a volunteer just to read the quote at the bottom? I will. This is Paula. Thank you. <clears throat> the first consists of overt acts by individuals. This type can be recorded by television cameras. It can frequently be observed in the process of commission. The second type, less overt, far more subtle, less identifiable in terms of specific individuals committing the acts, but it is no less destructive of human life. The second type originates in the operation of established and respected forces in the society and thus receives far less public condemnation than the first type. Stokely Carmichael. Thank you for sharing that. So I wanted to start here. Um, and again, we could talk about these in their own individual sessions um, for weeks and months at a time, um, but to really help us think about all the different ways that racism can play out in our classroom spaces. And so I want us to now think about these three questions as we go through. So first, where have you seen examples show up in your own educational spaces as a student and an educator? Okay, so where have you seen these things show up? Okay, um, what is the connection between how racism manifests in the classroom and human rights? So how does our students' experience with racism in the class connect to this idea of human rights? Okay, and what stands out to you as an area of deeper growth or exploration for your own journey? So think about your journey as an anti-racist educator and human rights educator. What stands out as an area where I need to engage in some deeper reflection and some deeper growth? Okay. Okay. So when thinking about the different places or different ways that these different areas might manifest in the classroom specifically, we also know that racism manifests in the larger school system and in the school-wide structures as well. For the purpose of today's conversation, we're going to zoom in down on the classroom level. So we're gonna be talking less about system-wide um, things in this particular conversation, but I wanted to highlight some ways that it can show up in our actual on the ground classroom spaces. And so the areas that we're gonna look at are our physical space. So how does that show up just in the physical environment, the way it's set up, the way it's structured, the resources, the materials in our physical space? Um, how does it show up in our policies and our procedures? So our rules, our expectations, our routines, how does it manifest there? Um, in peer interaction, so between students themselves, um, in student educator interaction, so between us and our young people, in how we engage families, and then also in our curriculum and materials. Okay, so I am going to share some ideas um, with you all, but I'm also going to invite you to share other examples that you may have seen or experienced as we go. Okay. So thinking about physical space, um, some of the ways that this might manifest in physical space are just absence of critical resources and inadequate resources. Okay, so I've worked in schools that do not have functional water fountains, do not have functional bathrooms, do not have soap, do not have basic hygienic materials, um, are in dilapidated classrooms and dilapidated buildings. I taught in a classroom that was below ground level with no natural sunlight and very poor ventilation. Um, and so these are, you know, larger systemic issues, but these can also boil down to an individual classroom that we're working in if we don't have the materials in the environment that our children need to even engage in a healthy space. 
Um, lack of inclusive representation in the physical space. Um, I was more thinking on the long lines of what we put in our classroom and what we put on our walls. So if you're someone who uses posters and decorations and different things like that, what is the representation? What is being reflected back to them um, when they come into the space through print, through images that we're using to decorate our classrooms? Um, exclusionary seating, okay? So using exclusionary seating as a form of punishment um, or um, for a particular student and hyper surveillance. So that can also be related to seating. So seating children in a way that we're engaging in hyper surveillance over certain students or over specific students. Um, when we think about policies and procedures, this can take the form of thinking about overly restrictive or oppressive behavioral expectations, okay? So that can be everything from policing student speech. Um, and so when I talk about policing speech, that can be everything from the amount that they're allowed to talk. Um, and so an overuse of silent periods or silent time and over policing the amount that they're able to speak. Um, it can also relate to policing their actual form of speech. Um, and so not allowing students to use their authentic voices or their dialects or the way that they speak in their day-to-day -day lives in the classroom um, under this expectation that they speak in a certain way or in a proper way. Um, it can also play out in restricting and policing movement. Um, and so this can be everything from forcing students to sit in a certain box and then having them be penalized if their bodies move outside of that box because our bodies move and need to move. Um, or students getting into trouble for not being able to control or over control their bodies in a way that's not developmentally appropriate for them to have, for them to, have to do. Um, other ways that this might show up in policies and procedures is policing appearance. And that can be policing what they wear and their hairstyles based on stereotypes or narratives about what those items of clothing mean or what those hairstyles mean and whether they're appropriate for school. Um, and then an over focus on kind of respectability and conformity in the space. Um, and on some of these slides, you're gonna see some real life examples. Um, I'm not gonna read through them all just for the sake of time, but they are there on the screen just to highlight that these are not things that just happen in theory. Right? These are things that happen in real schools and real classrooms across our country um, where Black children, um, Indigenous children, Latino, Latina, Latinx children um, are policed in the way that they speak, in the way that they act, in the way that they move their bodies, in the way that they show up um, in very real ways. So it also plays out in peer interaction. Um, so again, thinking about how students speak to each other, whether that's through jokes, and I put jokes in quotation because it's not really a joke, it's not funny. I find a joke to be something that's funny, and so it might be said as a joke, but it's not a joke. Um, slurs, um, stereotyping and excluding students based on their race, um, and then also bullying, which could be verbal bullying, physical bullying, um, and again, I've put some examples up from real life classrooms um, across the country. And so when thinking about student-teacher interaction, I just wanted to highlight some ways that this could play out in our interactions with young people as well. Um, and so I cannot tell you the amount of times, whether I have been coaching somebody or doing training or working with folks where the importance of pronouncing students' names was just dismissed um, or overlooked. Um, I remember I was working with a teaching fellow um, and we were in Flatbush and this was a a summer school program that was all um, black identified children. Um, and this fellow was a white male identified person um, and just was having a really hard time with their class. And every time I would go and observe, they were saying you and pointing. And when given the feedback that, hey, maybe you should call the students by their names, that might help with forging some connection and some respect between you, the response was, um, well, their names are too hard for me to pronounce because of cultural differences. Um, and so these are ways that these start to play out in our classrooms. If we cannot honor um, something as basic as what a student chooses to call themselves, their name, um, how do we expect to build relationships and build trust um, in that space? Um, this can also play out in mocking student speech or culture. Um, and sometimes this comes out in a way of trying to connect with students or trying to connect with their way of speaking or their culture, but can actually come out as mocking 
um, rather than being authentic and being genuine in your communication with students, um, using racial slurs and stereotypes themselves. Um, this also plays out in tokenism. Um, and so this particularly is the case if you have a situation where you are teaching a, a black student um, or another student of color that is in a space where they are one of or the only one of that identity in that space. And anytime we talk about um, a black character or what we perceive as a black issue, you turn to that student and expect them to speak on it or be the representation for it. I've had that happen to me in my K through college education. Um, treating students or expecting students to be a model minority. And so when educators do this, we interact or say things to a student where, oh, you're not like other this, or you don't speak like other this, or you're different than other this. Um, and so treating students as if they're somehow some type of outlier um, from other people who share their identity um, in a way that is supposed to be a compliment, but is really quite offensive um, to the larger group of students. Um, lowering expectations for students um, around what students can achieve and what they can accomplish and what they can do. Um, and also having a philosophy of colorblindness. So I don't see color or erasing students' identities in your interactions. So another area where racism manifests in our classrooms is in family engagement, right? And so thinking about assumptions we make about families based on their knowledge, their skill level, their values, making assumptions about those things, um, stereotyping based on family structure, especially if they don't fit our idea of what a traditional family structure is supposed to be, um, and not acknowledging the cultural knowledge they bring and the other expertise and lived experience that they bring um, into the classroom and into the education of their young person. And then the last area we wanted to look at was curriculum, okay? And so thinking about the ways that racism shows up in our curriculum, um, just to highlight a few here, so thinking about a focus on Eurocentric history, literature, and methods, um, and that can be through complete erasure, again, of contributions or study um, of people of color to fields of study. So that could be math, that could be science, social studies, literature, but completely erasing or ignoring their contributions to those fields or their methods of study in those fields. Um, erasure, erasure and revisionist history, um, deliberately embedding race, racist content into questions. And so I have some examples here around where this is just overt um, inclusion of racist content in curriculum and in questions designed for students. Um, an emphasis on oppression without focus on resistance. Okay, and so when we are talking about and trying to tell the truth about oppression and racism, it is also really important that we emphasize narratives of resistance and not cast people as passive, right? All throughout history, there has been oppression, there has been marginalization, but there's also been fight and resistance. And it's important in anti-racist education that we create balance, right? That students hear the truth about how things have happened and how things are still happening, but that they also hear the truth about resistance um, and know that that's a part of their narrative and their identity and their history as well. Um, and that we're also emphasizing narratives of daily life and regular life and joy and creativity. Um, and that that's a part of what they're seeing when they see narratives as well. Um, and another way that it might show up is just lack of authentic or diverse means of assessment. So expecting all students to show up or show their learning in the same way um, or deliberately using tools that we have already proven to be biased. And so I'm gonna pause for a second and I want to go back to these questions. I know that I've shared a lot of examples verbally, um, and I want to create some space for folks to share um, any places where they have seen this show up in their own educational spaces, um, how this connects to human rights, and anything that's now jumping out to you as, hey, this is something I think I need to lean into in my own practice. So you don't have to respond to all of them. You can choose one that stands out to you but either in the chat, um, and I'd love to hear one or two voices out loud to share some reflections as well. Um, just think about these questions. Where have you seen this show up? How does how these things manifest connect to this idea of human rights? And what stands out as an area of deeper growth and exploration in your own journey?
we'd love to hear from someone. If you want to unmute yourself, you can feel free to chime in. Oh, okay, I'll share. I was a little bit confused. Um, so are we answering all three or are we just starting with the reflection part? You can choose any of the ones that you're called to respond to. So you can choose one of them. It doesn't have to be in this order. If there's one in particular where you have a reflection you want to share, you can go for it. Okay, uh, so I'll start then. Uh, so I wrote down like a few things. I won't go into details about many of them, but uh, with the ones that specifically regards to me and my colleagues I'll speak about. So like police and speech and movement are things that apply to my school community, mispronounced saying student names and not, you know, thinking of the importance to get to know them, um, lowering of expectations for students who may be struggling or not showing any engagement or interest, um, the model minority. Uh, so the model mi minority, I would say among teacher and teacher interaction, not student teacher necessarily, it would be model mi minority stereotyping of families and what families do or don't do in regards to their child education. Um, and then for me specifically, I think I fall under the passive narrative, emphasizing oppression, but not focusing enough on the resistant aspect. And I think that that's a result due to curriculum and timing, and there's just never enough time to do much things, trying to keep up with the pace of what we have to do uh, or mandated to do. So I think that's for me to apply that that's where I need more focus in making those, you know, those lessons or learning segments incorporate the resistance uh, equally, like you were saying, have that balance. Thank you for sharing. Can I have one more person just offer any insight into the space so it can be a reflection, a connection, or something that's coming up for you that you want to focus some more attention on? Just one more person. I think for me, my name is Doretha Levine. I, um, I work at a private school and I've noticed when uh, we teach history is always from a passive. You know, we teach the Underground Railroad and they, the slaves were running and I, this past um, school year, I started a history process group where we look at the empowerment, the resistance, the strength of the people that endure, who kept resisting, kept getting knocked down, but they kept persisting. So the change that narrative, but it was really hard uh, to change that narrative because um, I think it was something, it was a curriculum that's been taught for many years. So they always teach the Underground Railroad. Um, they don't teach about Black Wall Street or the Elena Massacre or, um, you know, even Seneca Village in Central Park where people uh, were very resilient. So um, I think for me, it's like looking at the resiliency and see the power, the, resi the resiliency that still exists today. And, and to teach our students, especially our students of color, when we're teaching about history, um, not a passive being beaten down, uh, not fighting back, but our empowerment. Um, I think if you teach it from a powerful perspective, and then the other students can uh, sort of relate to it as not being people who just took it and are still taking it, but um, the power within. And so I was thinking about that. I think for me, as, as a connect to me, is um, to continue to teach this other narrative. Uh, because I think we're taught a narrative for a reason, and it's been taught for many years. Uh, and uh, to sort of this put a little dent in that narrative uh, has been really helpful so far. It's been, in fact, the teachers have been, it's amazing um, when you change a narrative from an empowerment, from a passive, the comments and the feedback has been great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and thank you all for sharing your reflections. I encourage you to continue to do that as we go. Um, so I am going backwards. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to make some connections about, we're really thinking about if these are the different ways that racism can manifest. And again, the examples that I shared and ones that we discussed are certainly not exhaustive. Um, what impact um, can that have on the wellness of the young people that we work with? And why is it important for us to focus on this? So in a second, we're gonna move into breakout groups to have some discussion about this. Um, but I wanted to highlight um, five areas of wellness that I'd like you to consider in your discussion. So the first one is just intellectual wellness. So we think about our intellectual wellness, that's our curiosity, our creativity, our 
ability to express ourselves, to think critically, to seek out new challenges, that love for learning. Um, our emotional wellness is about recognizing and expressing our emotions, our feelings, um, being in tune with that and being able to express those. Uh, being able to manage stress. Okay, stress is a part of life. How can we navigate and regulate and manage that? And just in general, having a positive approach to life. And that doesn't necessarily mean feeling good all the time or being positive all the time, but overall, I have a positive approach to my life. Um, our social wellness is about how we can create and maintain health healthy relationships? Are we at our healthy body and our healthy lifestyle um, and the choices and the habits that we make, um, but maintaining a healthy body? And then spiritual. So how are we finding meaning and purpose in our life? Um, and how do we exhibit compassion towards others? And so we're going to move into breakout groups and Adnan's going to set those up for us. But I want you to think about and discuss with your group what might experiencing racism? So think about some of the things that we talked about, okay? Not seeing yourself, okay? Seeing stereotypical, stereotypical representations, learning a skewed history or learning a passive history about, about who you are and who your people are. Um, facing social exclusion or bullying from your peers. Um, facing discriminatory or harsh um, discipline from, from your teachers. Um, having people carry beliefs about you and what you're able to achieve. Um, thinking about all these things that our young people might experience in the classroom, how might this affect these different dimensions of wellness for them? Okay? How might that affect these different dimensions of wellness? And how might that manifest in our classroom? What, what, what might we observe or, or what might we witness? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna break some out into rooms or probably like five to six people per room. Um, so just for the sake of time, try to be as concise as you can in your group. So I'm going to break everyone out just right now. everyone's in a room. You can hear me, right, Carolyn? Yeah. Yeah, we're running really short on time. <laughs> I think the beginning, because I think we were waiting for so many people to join, the, like a vast majority joined late. Yeah, we didn't really start the, this, we didn't really start the session until like 20 minutes in, which is like the timing of a whole section. <laughs> so let me see. <laughs> um, yeah, we're definitely not going to get through everything. So let me just see how we can adjust. I mean, we can cut this a little short. Like, it's just about getting some conversation started. I think some people will go. Maybe not everyone will share in these breakout rooms, but at least some people will. Yeah, I think we'll probably have to bring them back after like five minutes. Um, let me see what's left. So we'll come back. We'll have them do some sharing, and I'll share anything that they don't fill in. So if I think we leave them in, the, we bring them back from the breakout rooms at 3.15, it'll probably take another five minutes to wrap up that section. So that'll leave us with about 20 minutes. Um, I mean, about 10 minutes. Okay. So that just means I'm gonna have to talk through this more than or a little bit faster. 
Um, we can also, you know, invite folks who can stay on for and just like let people know, like we started late, just allowing folks to join. So folks yeah. can hang out for another five minutes. So we can invite folks to do that. Um, and also let them know we'll be sharing the PowerPoint and sharing the content um, for things that we don't get a chance to cover. Okay. Yeah, sorry, the timing's not really working out. No, that's on us too. I don't, I don't like, because we had to start late to get enough people because it like, it was the balance of like, starting when like 10 other people start joining like halfway through versus yeah. you know i think i think we'll find most people because it's later in the day we'll have time to just stick around a little bit longer i think i think we'll find enough people want to stay on longer just let me know when you want me to close the breakout rooms and i can do that okay. uh, maybe let's bring them back at three fifteen. how do you think it's going so far I think it's going fine. Um, Cause I mean, this is something that folks have been asking for. Um, and I think considering people are in a variety of different places, one, these are people who are in a diet, bunch of different geographic locations. I know someone's in from the UK versus someone is all the way up from the West coast versus someone's an educator in like the Northeast. Someone here I know is from the South. So like, it's good that it's like, I think it's great because it's a it's a great start to a larger conversation that we're trying to have. Um, and the other pieces, we've gotten feedback from our other sessions where it, it, people have felt like some things have been too general and we're talking about really specific things as a start point for people to think about, like what is a, because you're, you're pointing out very specific things like family engagement that they might have not really thought about that or peer to peer interaction or um, so there's a lot of specificity that folks have asked for that I'm seeing in the session now that I, I'm, a, I'm pretty certain we'll get some good feedback on that. So I think it's going well. Um, I'm surprised that we had so many people register. Register, yeah. Because we had 66 people and only half showed up. I, I wonder if it's, because um, outside of New York, a lot of folks have started the school year. Yeah. So I wonder if that has to do with the intention to want to sign up and then boom, a lot of stuff has come on their plane. Like hitting, yeah. yeah so so that, that's going to be, that's going to be our, our biggest challenge even internally of what we're going to do moving forward to get a lot of people in, because our main audience are educators, but when's the right time to do virtual trainings with them now? Right. It's going to be very difficult. I'm sure you guys have talked about it too, if you're going to continue virtual interactions with educators. And there seems to be a word limit on the broadcast. I can't even put everything in there. I didn't realize that was a limitation. So you can only put so many sentences like words in a broadcast. Gary's been great. He's been coming to most of our most of our sessions. Yeah. Mary, do you know Mary? By chance? Mm -mm. Were they here? I think they were here before. Maybe they. they... Before and then they. I'll admit her. I think we can bring folks back. Okay. Uh, bring folks back here. It'll give them like a 60 second. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll give them another minute. How many groups did they end up in, Anna? It was just three groups because I saw a bunch of people pop off. So it was like, it's about like five people per group ish, five, six people per group. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Just going to give the other groups a moment to come back and then we'll continue.
All right, so it looks like we have most folks back from breakout groups. So I know those were a bit briefer than we planned. Um, we started the session a little bit late, um, just to try to give folks some more time to come on. So we're running a little bit shorter on time than planned. Um, so sorry we cut that discussion a little bit, um, but I would love to hear um, just some of what you discussed. So can we just have some folks from groups just share out a little bit on what you discussed in your group? What's the connection or the impact between the racism children might experience and these dimensions of wellness? And I'll put them back up. Okay, and again, if you wanna share out loud, you can unmute um, and start, or you can use the hands raised and I'll, I'll give you a shout. So maybe we can do group by group. Maybe just one person from group one real quick. That was the group that had Bridget, Denise, Paula, and the two weights. <laughs> One of the things that was discussed was people uh, of color, especially students of color, not being able to have access maybe to some health and wellness needs that they may find themselves wanting like counseling or therapy or or some kind of services that may help them after they've experienced some of this trauma in classrooms. So students not necessarily having if they are experiencing challenges with their wellness, not necessarily having the access um, to the support that they need okay, to navigate it. What else? Any, any group can go at, at this point. I think, uh, I mean, my group members can speak also, but um, I think about the students in the classroom who are not of color, but they're watching. When they're watching um, students of color sort of being called out or name not pronounced or um, um, being policed by their movement, it has an impact on them too. And so, how do they see that student? Do they join in with the teachers? Do they join in with the community to um, see that student as uh, um, less than, or do they get protective of that student? Um, and how does that student view the classmate when they're being called out in front of everyone? Like, what is the um, like what's the impact on the whole entire class? Sharing. So, also speaking about. What impact does that have on students who are witnessing these things occur? And I think that can be for other children of color in the space. Maybe they aren't receiving it personally, but they're witnessing that happen to somebody who looks like them. Um, so we talk a lot about like vicarious trauma. And so what happens when you are a witness to something like that happening to someone who looks like you? Um, we talk about that a lot when we're viewing things on the media. Um, we might not be there experiencing it, but that is still having an impact on our levels of stress and our anxiety and our fear and our emotions. Um, and so that can be the same for other children in the classroom space who are witnessing the dehumanization, dehumanization of a classmate. Um, let's hear one or two other ideas. How might these dimensions of wellness be impacted? Um, let's think about specifically for a student who is experiencing racism. So we've talked a little bit about students that have witnessed it. What about students who are experiencing it themselves? How might these dimensions of wellness be impacted by that? Let's hear one or two more ideas. Um, if you're more comfortable, you can drop your idea in the chat. Go for it. Yeah, so I have seen where students are not um, acknowledged at all. So in the dynamic of the classroom, you're raising your hand and you know, you're not called on. So it's as if you are not seen at all. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't see yourself in the iconography of the school, when you don't see yourself in the books and in, you know, the pedagogy that is being taught, and then in the actual classroom, you're not acknowledged. Um, that has an impact on <laughs> all of these things across the board. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Um, so I'm gonna share some additional ideas just to add to the conversations that you all had. Um, something else I wanna acknowledge is that because we started a bit late, 
um, I am moving a bit more quickly than I wanted to, and we do have another section. Um, and so I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can to cover as much as, as I can, um, but it's designed for a bit more time. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I want to invite folks who have um, you know, an extra five, 10 minutes to hang around who want to stay um, to do so, but I'm gonna try my best to honor everybody's time and, and end as closely to where we said we were gonna end as possible. Um, either way, content will be sent out along with additional resources. So if for some reason you have to hop off, um, we will send a follow-up um, as well, okay? So some areas that I wanted to highlight, um, as far as intellectual wellness um, for children who might be experiencing what, what racism in the classroom, um, we said intellectual wellness is, is speaking about creativity and curiosity, creative expression, um, taking on new challenges. And so a student who is experiencing this might feel stifled, right? Their creativity, their creative wellness, their creative expression, their ability to think outside of the box might feel stifled. Um, there might be a fear of failure or avoiding risk um, if they are constantly being critiqued, constantly being called out, um, if they feel like their abilities are being, are being challenged or not being not acknowledged, that might lead to fear of failure, avoiding taking on new challenges, and also a ne negative self-concept about what they can do and what they can accomplish. Um, am I smart? Am I creative? Can I do, can I do this? Um, when we think about emotional wellness, this can lead to heightened levels of stress or anxiety, okay? If this is what you're experiencing in the classroom from your peers, from your teachers, um, through your lessons, that will lead to stress and potentially anxiety depending on how that manifests with the student. Um, as far as emotional expression, that could lead to a spectrum. It could be repression where a student doesn't feel safe and doesn't feel like they have a safe space to express themselves and so they repress and hold in how they're feeling or it can lead to the opposite where it becomes explosive because the student is experiencing so much frustration based on what they're experiencing and don't have a safe space to express that in a healthy way. And so it's leading to explosion. Um, it, it might also lead to loneliness and a sense of detachment, um, especially if they're dealing with social isolation and bullying, okay? Um, as far as social wellness, so their ability to form healthy relationships and connections with others, this might manifest as isolation or withdrawal. It might manifest as social anxiety. Um, something that I've also seen is it manifests as assimilation. So a student might feel like they need to change themselves in order to fit in, or they might need to dial themselves down or dial down their culture or dial, dial, change the way that they speak, change the way that they act, the dress they show up to blend in or to fit into this larger social structure that deems the way that they are to be unacceptable or less than or other. And so that social wellness might be impacted by a student who feels like they can't be them, their authentic selves. And so they adjust or shift or change to try to fit in. Um, and it might also manifest as aggression um, in the social space, especially if they're being actively bullied, um, disrespected or assaulted. Um, as far as physical space, this might manifest as physical manifestation of trauma. And we're gonna look in a second at some examples of how this might impact their actual physical wellness. And then last, we think about spiritual wellness. So my sense of self, um, my sense of meaning, my sense of purpose, if I am experiencing these things in the classroom, that might manifest as a low, again, self-concept self and self-esteem. And I might have a bleaker outlook just on my life and on my future um, if this is what I'm experiencing. When we think about physical manifestations of stress and trauma, these things are not unique to the experience of racism, um, but they certainly apply because we know that racism and experiences with racial violence can lead to stress, anxiety, and a trauma response from students. And so these things certainly apply. And so again, we might see student students who respond in survival mode or shift into survival mode when they are experiencing a trigger. Um, and so again, that's that fight mode where we move into that need to protect ourselves through verbal or physical way, um, or withdraw students who freeze, so students who have a hard time communicating or shut down or become withdrawn. Um, and then also the fawn response. So that speaks more to the students who move into a space of people pleasing or assimilating because they that is their response to the stress and the anxiety that these experiences are causing, right? That's their way to keep themselves safe, okay? We might also see somatic symptoms, okay? So when we are under a significant amount of stress, 
and tension and anxiety, that can manifest as physical symptoms. So you might see students with headaches, with stomach aches that can't be explained, um, but it's because that's connected to their emotional state. Okay, we might also see restlessness or agitation with student bodies um, or students who are just fatigued and tired. Okay, um, so these are some things we might see as physical manifestations of students who are experiencing racism over time um, in their classroom spaces. Um, in the long term, these are just some on some long term effects that we might see for students who are experiencing this on an ongoing and long term basis. Um, so one thing that we might see is that survival mode becomes a new way of being. Okay, we all move into survival mode. That is a physiological response to, to fear, to stress, to a perceived threat. We all do it. Um, when students are experiencing these things chronically and over a period of time, that becomes a new way of being. So even in situations where there is safety and this isn't a concern, that can just become a way of functioning or a way of being um, in general. Okay. Um, we also see actual physical changes with the brain um, when students are experiencing chronic stress and trauma over extended periods of time. And these things impact memory, they impact the functions of learning, um, they impact the parts of the brain that are connected to motivation and risk taking. Um, they also impact the parts of the brain related to stress response and self-regulation. Um, so things being able to calm myself down, um, things being able to bring myself down when I'm hyper aroused. Um, on another note, as far as physical manifestations, um, a lot of folks have heard about things like stress hormones and things like cortisol and how prolonged kind of exposure to stress um, increases the presence of those hormones in our bodies. Um, prolonged exposure to stress hormones leads to things like inflammation in our bodies, which we know is connected to chronic disease. Um, there was a report that I'll share with you all in the follow-up from um, from pediatricians that was talking directly about the impact of racism and racial experiences on the physical health of adolescents. Um, and this is one of the things that they pointed to um, is that this can actually lead to chronic disease. Um, because when we are chronically exposed to high levels of stress and trauma, um, this is the impact that is physiologically having on our body. So it's not just emotional, it can actually impact our students' health physically. Okay. And so I just want to close out this section um, with a final wrap up question and I invite you to reflect on this in the chat. Um, and the question is, how does a focus on wellness connect to being an anti racist and human rights educator right so we said anti racism is a conscious and active approach to addressing multi dimensional racism. And human rights education is focused on again learning about for and through human rights to create that type of world. What does wellness and a focus on wellness have to do with this as an educator? Why does a focus on wellness matter if we are trying to be anti-racist and human rights educators? So just think on that in a minute. And if you have thoughts, you can drop them on the chat. If you have a strong desire to share it out loud, go for it. Um, excuse me, uh, T, I had a comment. Um, yeah, I was, please. I didn't say anything before because I wanted to give space. Um, I tend to, you know, talk a lot. But I wanted to go back to the uh, spiritual wellness aspect. Yeah, please. Um, and in our group, I had mentioned that, you know, I don't think that the spiritual aspect is ever really addressed unless the school leadership, you know, is approving of something like that. Um, but I also wanted to look at this, you know, the specific terminology that you had on the slide for the spirituality. To me, that just still sounds like social emotional learning to me, based on the wording that was there, as far as outlook, purpose of life. When I think of uh, sp spirituality and well-being as a result of Hinduism, I think of, uh, you know, using yoga practices and mindfulness practices as a way of refining the brain so it can reflect the universe or reflect what creation is. In other words, um, Hinduism implies that the mind is competent enough to experience existence 
the same way we experience life through the five senses. And the process of doing that is to purify the energy body so our mind could go into higher states of consciousness so we could be more aware of that which does not reflect light, that which we can't perceive with the five senses. So I say that to say that uh, as an educator, I'm really pa passionate about you know making those connections between spirituality and education because I don't think that we have a clear understanding of what we mean by a spiritual practice based off of you know all the religions and different ideologies, belief systems we have related to religions. I think we're confused with what the purpose of all of those things are. So I just wanted to add that to the discussion. So it sounds like, and you know, let me know if I'm, if I'm characterizing this well, that you're looking for a more expansive um, categorization of what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual wellness. And a lot of what you mentioned, um, a lot of what you mentioned, Gary, for me, um, also serves as the vehicles and different things that we can use to help students um, move to that space where they have a sense of, of who they are and their purpose and their meaning in life. Um, and so it sounds like there's connection between this idea of spiritual wellness being how we find deeper and higher meaning um, in, in ourselves and our life's purpose. Um, and that some of those things that you mentioned as far as meditation and spiritual practice are some of the vehicles that students can use to achieve that that area of wellness. Um, but so we need to look at how we are being more expansive in how we define spiritual wellness. Is that is that right? You're absolutely right. Thank you for offering that. Okay, I'm going to just pull a couple of other thoughts from the chat around the connection between wellness. Um, and so I'm just seeing at the simple level, just wanting what's best for children. Okay, we can't be anti-racist and human rights educators if we don't genuinely want what's good for children. I have worked with people who work with children who do not like children. And I'm like, how do you not like children? You're working with children, right? And so there's no way we can invest in being anti-racist and human rights educators if we don't deeply love, care about, and want at, the, at every level them to be, them be their best and highest selves. And we can't do that um, without a focus on their wellness, right? Uh, we can't do that without a focus on their wellness. Um, but that needs to be embedded. And so I think that is core to anti-racist and human rights um, education. Okay, and then I'm also just gonna uplift a comment from Mitra. Um, and so just thinking about them all being related and dependent on each other for ultimate success and ensuring best outcomes for each individual as well as society at large. So all those things being interconnected um, for our individual and our collective well-being. So thank you all for sharing. Um, so we're going to transition into our last section. I know Adnan just put a note asking if folks can hang around. I also want to acknowledge your time. So if that doesn't work for your schedule, we will send additional resources, but I will move into our last section. Um, so just to recap, we started our session by centering on different types of racism and thinking about how those ways that those might play out in our classroom spaces. And then we made some connection between the experiences that students might have and how it might impact their wellness in different areas. So that intellectual, that physical, that emotional, that mental, um, and that spiritual, expanding spiritual wellness as well. Um, and really thinking about when students are having these experiences in our spaces, what's going on with them? What's happening to them? How is that impacting them? And when you really start to take a deep look at like, oh my God, this is what might be happening <laughs> you know, to young people, this is what they might be experiencing. This is how this might be impacting them on these different levels. Um, and how as an educator, is it important for me to zoom in on that impact, especially if I want to engage in anti-racist and human rights practice. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to offer to close out this conversation are just considerations um, for bringing everyday anti-racism into your classroom. And so rather than just offer kind of a list of tips, I wanted to share habits that I think are important to a practice of anti-racist and human rights education. And then just some considerations that we can use to reflect on our practice on an ongoing basis. Okay. Um, and so I'd like to bring another voice into the room because I feel like I'm speaking a lot. Um, can I have a volunteer just read um, some of these habits of anti-racist and human rights educators? So just to bring these into the space, what are some habits that we might want to form as anti-racist and human rights educators. So let's hear a new voice. Habits of anti-racist and human rights educators. They create intentional space for ongoing and honest reflection 
They consistently interrogate practices and curriculum. They invest in their own healing. They consistently seek out and take advantage of opportunities to learn. They listen to and amplify the voices, stories, and needs of those most impacted by racism and oppression. They practice critical humility. They cultivate empathy. They actively disrupt racism. They center racial justice and human rights in teaching practices and curriculum and study pedagogies grounded in the identities of their students. Thank you, Benji. Um, so a lot of this is grounded in honesty and humility, right? And so thinking about how am I humble, um, how am I honest, and how am I critical, okay? And where am I interrogating? That includes interrogating my own identity, my own power, my own privilege, my own positionality, and how that manifests in my curriculum, in my teaching practices, in my relationships with students, um, interrogating what I've been taught, right? So much of my work um, and so much of my growth as an educator has been unlearning, okay? I've learned a lot, but it's also been a lot of unlearning about how I engage and what I think I know and what I've been taught. Um, many of us have been educated in a system that has been built on white supremacy and racism. And so if we mean to move forward as educators through a lens of anti-racist and human rights educators, that means we have to unlearn a lot of what we were taught, right? And so this practice is not only learning curriculum to teach kids, it's also correcting and unlearning and undoing a lot of the things that were ingrained in us via our own education and our own even training to become teachers, right? And so there's a lot of interrogation of what we learned, of what, what we were trained to do, of what we were led to believe, um, and how we begin to interrogate, reflect on, and undo and unlearn, and begin to make this shift. So it's learning and it's unlearning. And that requires reflection, critique, honesty, willingness to listen, and it requires healing, right? And so we also have to invest space in our own healing, our own stressors, our own trauma, for educators of color, our own trauma related and stress related to racism that we are bringing into the space. Um, all of this is involved and in things that we have to do habitually. You don't just arrive at it. It's something that we do every day consistently on an ongoing basis. And so just coming back to this visual, which we presented in the beginning on different ways that racism might play out, we're gonna flip this and now just look at some reflection questions or considerations that we can use when we're trying to build that anti-racist or human rights focused classroom. So when thinking about policies and procedures, first thing I always wanna think about is what kind of space am I even trying to create here, right? What is the environment that I wanna create? And how do I want my students to feel when they come into that space? How do I want them to feel? What do I want them to know about themselves, to think about themselves, to feel about themselves? Okay, what is my vision for that space? Because everything else is gonna drive that right? What are the purpose and goals of my classroom rules and procedures, right? Something that I've been doing a lot in workshops around classroom management is really asking folks to interrogate what is the motivation behind rules, procedures, and routines, right? And very often what we will uncover is a lot of it is about power and control and not about necessity or about learning, right? And so when you are thinking about setting up your classroom rules, routines, and procedures, ask yourself, is this necessary and why? Who told me that? Where did they get that from? Who does this serve? Does this serve the students or does this serve me in the classroom? Does it serve curiosity and creativity and learning and safety and community or does it serve power and control? What does it serve? Okay, and are they developmentally appropriate? Another way that racism manifests in classrooms is through adultification. I've worked in schools across um, public, private, charter, independent, different um, makeups as far as race and ethnicity, and there is a stark difference between, particularly in the early childhood space, what happens across these different schools, okay, and what expectations are for behavior for small children, right, and a lot of that is grounded in racism, and so are what we expecting of children even developmentally appropriate or supportive of their development when it comes to our rules and our routines and procedures, okay. 
something else to think about when creating an anti-racist classroom is how do I co-create expectations and boundaries with my students? Again, this is not teacher directed or teacher centered, teacher led. This is community directed and community led. So how do I work with students to identify what our expectations and boundaries are going to be? So how do I bring student voice, agency, and ownership into creating that classroom environment? Um, how are we going to hold each other accountable? What do we expect of each other? How are we going to repair harm in this space? How do we want to treat each other in this space? Okay. And then what kind of power dynamics are being created through my rules and expectations? When thinking about peer interactions, some things I wanted to uplift are how are empathy and inclusivity going to be fostered in your space? Okay, this has to be something that's deliberate. Okay, I work primarily with tiny humans um, in an early literacy program for after school, and we are very deliberate about curating books and experiences and conversations that focus on building empathy and an understanding around what it means to be inclusive and uplift and honor and normalize difference. These are conversations that we're having with kindergartners, first graders, and second graders. So how are empathy and inclusivity being deliberately fostered in your space? Okay. Um, where are you creating opportunities for community building? Okay. If we are seeing that students are engaging in peer interactions in a way that is harmful, how are we building community? How are we helping them get to know one another and how are we building a stronger environment? And also, how are we disrupting instances of racism? Okay, that is something that needs to be thought about and prepared for. Okay, if an instance of racism comes up in my classroom between students, how am I going to engage with that? How am I going to interact? What is going to be my process? Um, something that I usually uplift for folks when they ask for steps that I would take, because it's a common question that I get, um, are first and foremost is taking a strong stance. Okay, you cannot waver on a stance around racist behavior in your classroom. So you have to demonstrate a strong stance to your students. You have to communicate that it's not acceptable and you have to maintain and create immediate safety. So if a student is in a situation where they're immediately unsafe, either emotionally or physically unsafe, the main priorities are to interrupt that and restore safety. Okay, once we have restored safety and again, reinforce that it's inappropriate, then we need to inquire. Okay, where did this come from, especially for the student who caused harm? Where did this come from? What is driving this belief? What is driving that action? And then we engage in learning and reparation of harm. Mm -hmm. And so what is your process? How are you going to engage with that? How are you going to disrupt that? Because educators taking a passive stance or taking a passive approach on racism in their classroom is just reinforcement of it. Okay. Thinking about what accountability and repairing harm is going to look like. Again, this is not about punishment and this is not about punitive or exclusionary measures. This is about how do we help students to understand their actions, take accountability, and how do we bring them together to repair harm? So what can that look like in your classroom space? Okay. In our space, how are we going to learn about, celebrate, and normalize difference? And then last but not least, how do we support students in learning how to disrupt and address instances of racism? How do we support them with developing that agency so that if they see it and experience it amongst their peers, they feel empowered to step in when and where it's safe. And then the, the next one that I wanted to highlight is student interaction. Um, and again, some questions for consideration are how are we building authentic relationships with our students? Okay, this work goes nowhere without authentic relationships with the students that you're working with. Okay, we can study everything that we want to study. We can write amazing lessons. We can do all of those things, but without authentic relationships, it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, um, what do you want to learn and what do you need to learn about your students and where do you need to develop cultural confidence to be able to engage with your students? Okay. How does my own identity, positionality, power, and privilege play out in my interaction? So we talked about the importance of interrogation. Okay. Who am I? Where am I operating from a place of power? Where am I operating from a place of privilege? And how is that playing out in my interactions and where does that need to be disrupted or reevaluated? 
what are narratives that I've been given by other people, by society, by teacher training, or that I've created about my students and how is that impacting my actions? Mm -hmm. How am I gonna keep the humanity and dignity of students at the forefront of interactions? So no matter what's going on, no matter how I'm feeling, no matter where I'm at, yes, we're all humans and we're allowed to mess up and we're allowed to make mistakes. But how do we ensure that the humanity and dignity of our students is not jeopardized in our interactions? Where am I creating space for student impact and feedback in how I am working with them and engaging with them and the practices in our classroom? And am I seeing all of my students and really seeing them again? So not taking colorblind approaches, but also is my approach and understanding intersectional? Okay, so when we talk about approaching our students from an intersectional lens, we are looking at all of their identities that they're bringing and how those are all intersecting, how those all impact their experience and how those all interact with how I might see them, interact with them and treat them. And then the last section that we wanted to focus on um, is curriculum. Okay, and so again, just to offer some areas of consideration for curriculum, um, when you are interrogating your curriculum, thinking about what identities are present and which are absent, what's deprioritized. Um, we talked about that representational racism, right? So erasure, so who's missing? Who's being depicted in a singular or stereotypical way? How are they being depicted? What are the narratives? What are the characterizations? Whose voice is telling those stories in my curriculum? And how do I interrogate that? Um, how are we ensuring that contributions and culture of folks that are historically marginalized are uplifted accurately and consistently? Math, science, social studies, literature, whatever we are studying, there are vast contributions that are erased and ignored. How are we ensuring that those contributions are present consistently and accurately? And when I say consistently, not as a part of a special month, but as a part of our way of being and a way of our teaching practice. Another thing is where in our curriculum are we allowing for critical thinking, discourse, and connection to students' lived experience? Are we allowing them to interrogate? Are we allowing them to question? Are we allowing them to think outside the box? And is our curriculum grounded in real life, in the real world, and in their real lives, in their real world? And then the last two, um, does this allow for students to contribute and engage in ways that are diverse and authentic? Okay, very often ways that we are asking students to engage or demonstrate mastery are grounded in methods that are biased, are grounded in methods that are informed by a dominant cultural narrative, are impacted and driven by white supremacist thinking. And so when we think about how we're asking students to engage with content, and when we are asking them to demonstrate their knowledge and how we are assessing their, their knowledge or their mastery of something, are we interrogating that? How are we actually assessing? How are we setting expectations? How are we setting standards? What's driving that? And how are we assessing, assessing that? And are the methods that we are using to invite students to engage with curriculum and assess how they are engaging with that curriculum, are those methods diverse? And are they allowing students to do that in a way that is authentic? And then last but not least is, how does our curriculum connect to social justice and human rights? So many of the things we were talking about before are really looking at across the spectrum of our curriculum. And this one is more specific about how we are explicitly bringing content around social justice and human rights into our classrooms. Okay, is this an explicit part of our teaching and explicit part of our curriculum? And again, how are we using our teaching space to foster that critical consciousness, to invite them to interrogate the world, but also to equip with tools and space to create real change. So we're not just talking about theory, we're actually grounding that in real practice where children can feel empowered to make a difference. And then last but not least, are we orienting our curriculum in our classroom towards collective and community and against individualism?
Okay, so I know that was quite a bit um, and way more lecture style speaking than I typically like to engage, but wanted to make sure that we were able to cover um, those guiding questions and those points of consideration. Um, and so these are just some readings and some videos. I'm not gonna read through them because we will share them with you, um, but just to show you what's here, um, I've included a list of readings and videos that have been really helpful for me um, and that I continue to go back to and revisit in my own practice. Um, that I wanted to share with you and also a link to a list of really wonderful resources from the Abolitionist Teaching Network um, that just got published. And so these links will be shared with you. Um, and I also wanted to uplift some groups and organizations um, that I encourage folks to follow for deeper work. So more reading for curriculum, for training. And the ones that I've highlighted in black are organizations that are teacher-led, teacher and or parent-led. Um, groups that are engaging in anti-racist activism as we speak in the present, um, focused on everything from the in school on the ground level to the structural and systemic ways that racism shows up in our classrooms. And so if you're interested in engaging in some of that practice as well, I encourage you to take a look at some of these groups and seeing where you have capacity to join in to some of these conversations um, because this fight is happening at many different levels. And so for final reflection, um, first and foremost, thank you all for sticking around. Um, if you were able to stay on, I appreciate it. Um, but for a final reflection, um, and we're gonna do this again in the chat and I'll invite one or two folks to share if you'd like. Um, is what is a commitment that you are making after today's discussion? So think about the things that we've discussed and what is a commitment that you wanna make? And that can be a commitment to something that you're gonna read, something you're gonna learn more about, something you're gonna actively do as you head back into the classroom um, or back into whatever space you're working with. Um, what are support and resources you need to live that commitment out? And what does accountability look like for you in terms of living out that commitment? So I want to invite, invite everyone to just think about that on their own. What's a commitment that you will make? What are resources or support you need to live that commitment out? And what does accountability look like? Um, if there are folks who are ready with a response, I would love to invite anyone to share out loud. Um, and if you have a response ready, feel free to start dropping ideas in the chat. And then we will wrap things up. I'll speak. This is Paula. I really liked. Thank you, Paula. I really liked your terminology around interrogating my curriculum. So that's for me. That's some, I'm a music teacher, so that's something I'm gonna uh, strive to do. I teach preschool through eighth grade music, so strive to interrogate my curriculum and do better in that area. Thank you, Paula. Anyone else want to share a quick thought out loud before we wrap up, or in the chat? Tina, I just wanted to ask, what was that we broke out and we were writing on like a whiteboard? What was that program called again? Sure, so that is called Jamboard. Um, so it's actually another Google tool. So if you have a Google account, it's free. Okay. Um, yeah, and so I use that. Um, and then I'm also exploring Nearpod. Um, it's a little bit more involved. Um, but it's another kind of whiteboard type of tool where you can have students collaborate on a common tool and they can put up post-its. The thing I like about Nearpod is that they can also like each other's comments so you can see if there's like agreement. And Nearpod also has ways that you can build in games and um, other activities as well and bring in PowerPoint slides. So um, that one is also pretty cool. Um, Jamboard is simpler, but Nearpod also has some pretty cool things and it's all free, um, free to use. This Google, you said, right? Is this Google Drive or? Um, it's just another Google tool. So if you have a G, if you have a Google account, if you have a Gmail account, um, then you can just go. If you go um, up at that top where it usually has, you can open up the different types of Google tools. Um, you'll see Jamboard up there, or you can just Google Jamboard or um, search for Jamboard in your search engine, and it'll pop up. Thank you. All right, everyone. So again, I know we are over our time. And so I want to um, respect the rest of your afternoon and bring our conversation to a close. Um, so again, I wanted to thank you for joining and for hanging out um, past our scheduled time. Um, I know that there's way more 
conversation to be had and way more work to do and that a lot of the things we talked about today could be their own workshop and their own session um, to dig a little bit deeper. Um, but I'm hoping that you're walking away with some considerations um, as for moving your practice forward, um, new things that you want to look into, things you wanna reflect on, um, and some new insights to bring into your practice. Um, if this was not a new conversation for you, hopefully it was a good refresher and good reflection for you um, for your practice moving forward. Um, so thank you all for joining again, and I'm gonna turn it back to Anna for some housekeeping or follow-up. Thank you, Tara Lynn. First, first of all, thank you everyone for, for sticking by. I know trying to t navigate the virtual world with timing, let alone technology can be a little iffy. So just want to send a sincere sense of gratitude for those of you that stuck around and those of you that might be watching the recording later. Thank you for joining us earlier if you couldn't stay on for the whole duration. And of course, Tara Lynn, I want to thank you so much for making time to partner with us today on what we believe is a very, very important subject matter that we could honestly talk for hours and hours around. Um, and I just want to remind us, right, for, for Speak Truth to Power, our first and most important programmatic goal is around building educator capacity so that you can embed human rights education into the fabric of your pedagogy. Anti-racist pedagogy and education is a part of that. And this is what we aim to do. And we do that through partnerships, partnerships like the one that we're forming now with Tara Lynn and really uplifting those closest in those fields that are dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis and hearing from those experts. So I just wanna thank you, Tara Lynn, for partnering with us, collaborating with us and, and lending your expertise and experience and, and, and framing and lens to, to the work that really advances human rights uh, in our educational spaces and thus our world. So thank you so much. Um, and this is the foundation for everything human rights education, right? Um, we're gonna follow up uh, in an email to all of you that have registered and attended our session today um, with even more deeper engagement from a Speak Truth to Power lens. We're gonna send you more resources, whether it's our lesson plans, activities, uh, things that we have in partnership with Discovery Education, um, digital online material that you can use in distance learning. We're gonna uh, sort of compile a list that's relevant to this and send it to all of you in an email along with a copy of Tara Lynn's PowerPoint. Uh, for anything that you've missed, you can obviously look into those considerations and, and examples and, and practices to embed anti-racism into your classroom. Um, so we'll send a lot of that with you. And then just a plug, now that you've entered one of our sessions, if you're a brand new member, you're gonna always get uh, promotions of any upcoming virtual events that we might have. Um, so just keep a lookout. This is one of many upcoming virtual webinars and trainings that we're going to be providing. Um, so keep a lookout. We're going to keep looking for suggestions and further uh, resource familiarization of Speak Through to Power resources, more guest facilitators, more topics that are of interest that are relevant to human rights education. And we're going to keep providing those as much as we can to build that capacity. Um, Laura, any last closing comments before we officially close out? I think that pretty much covers it uh, in every way. I just wanted to thank Tara Lynn again for this wonderful session. Um, I know that I learned a lot and that it was just such a wonderful um, deep dive into so many of these issues that we could obviously talk about for hours longer. But yes, I hope that anyone else who um, joined us today would also come to, um, to, to join us again in the future. Uh, I will kind of echo um, a sentiment that Tara Lynn said at the beginning, although far less eloquently on my end, that you know when we are together, we know a lot more together and we can be stronger together and moving forward into this world as human rights educators and as anti-racist educators, I truly believe that we are stronger in that way. So yes, thank you again to Tara Lynn for her wonderful presentation and knowledge and thank you to everyone else. Thank you so much, everyone. Hey, everyone. Nice meeting you. Take care.